Hi and welcome to Susan Stanley Stitch and Time episode number 47. I'm Susan and I'm so happy you're here today. On this channel I like to talk about stitching, quilting, textile, dyes, sewing notions, and methods from the past and how they all interact. Uh, and I also share my projects. So if that sounds interesting to you, please stick around and uh, let's get started. On today's episode, I'll share some of my whips, which are my current projects I have been working on, a few pieces of haul. I'm going to introduce Corliss and a bit about her story. She's the young girl from 1870 that I'm crafting my next quilting stitching journey around and I'm going to share a quilt with you and give you a shop update and so it's going to be a lot of fun. I want to welcome my new subscribers and thank you all for your overwhelming interest in the 19th century dressmaker shears. I am so grateful to you for your support and I am so excited to be able to share these with you. For those of you who have put your name on the interest list, I've got that safely tucked away and I, I can take more uh, interest orders if, if there are people out there who would like to explore these shears. I will be communicating with you through floss tube and newsletters, so please sign up for the newsletter so you get the current update and status on things that are happening on this channel. I have so many ideas and plans for this year and I can't, I really, it's so exciting. I wish I could tell it tell you everything but little bits at a time. All right let's take a look at my whips. So one of the things that I've been working on is the scissor cases and I've cut a lot of these out. I'm starting to put them together in anticipation of the next set arriving. Um, so just so you know that's in progress. Uh, and then last time I shared with you that I was going to pull out the Old Scott again. This is a chart from Hands Across the Sea Samplers and I fell in love with it mostly because it just reminded me of my father and my ancestry. And at the time, uh, Sarah of Jane Says Eight on Instagram, and I will link her below, was also working on it, and I think several people have worked on it and and have finished it since then. I um, I put it aside for a time, and I I just bought it out last week, and I thought you know I'm ready to to dive in. And at the time that I that I initially looked at it, I really wanted to personalize it and make it my own for uh, in honor of my father. Now he has since passed away, so it's even more important now to honor him and his legacy. And I had been in communication with Rebecca of Hedro Stitching, and I knew that uh, my ancestor who came from Scotland, my great-grandfather, Walter Scott, came from Scotland to Virginia, Minnesota. And he came from a small town right across the border called Peebles. I believe that's how you pronounce it. I don't know. Please correct me if you know. Uh, and so I thought I need, to, I need to find out a little bit more about this place. And uh, she actually found quite a bit. She found the church where he was baptized. And uh, anyway, a lot of information that I, that I had not uncovered yet. But, in finding out about that town, I found out that it was a river. It, it was on a river. It's on a river, and uh, it's it's very um, it's well known for sa it's salmon. And I live in Seattle, which is also well known for salmon. So I thought, well, that's interesting. There is a <clears throat> Latin phrase that is the town's motto, and I'm going to scroll it here below, and it means something to affect that in in opposition we persevere and we you know we rise to the occasion that's a really terrible paraphrase but something along those lines basically it's in looking at watching the salmon struggle to go upstream they were relating to our human struggles and how it makes us stronger to push through them so anyway I'll, I'll need to learn more about that 
I want to add that to my sampler because I feel like that's where all of this started, this Scottish heritage for me. I do have a lot more, um, actually it's the River Tweed in Peebles is the river that the salmon run up. Uh, so I have a lot more I want to learn and in the process of stitching this I am reading the open access book of Remember Now Thy Creator by Naomi Tarrant. I'm going to put a picture in here and I will link below the open access site where you can go to read this book. This book is out of print and you can purchase a copy. It's just, it would blow my stitching budget for quite some time. So I haven't purchased it. And I do really like books in hand so much more than reading them on the internet. But however, I'm grateful it's there. And I'm doing, I want to do a lot of learning about these Scottish gr school girl samplers. Um, this chart, this sampler was from between 1740 1760 is estimated by Hands Across the Sea. And I want to see if I can date my ancestry back that far. My, my mother had done a lot of ancestry research and I've had other relatives do that as well. So I, I want to incorporate that into this sampler. And Sarah had also, has also done that. She's done a beautiful job. If you go to her Instagram, you can see what she's done to personalize it and her color changes are just stunning. So I want to to add that to this and I do want to do some changes in the colors as well and I have I have started doing that. So let me show you what I have done so far. I'm in a different setup Jay so I don't have my table. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> So the things, the thing that I started changing here was the colors on the flowers. And in the chart, these are red with a little bit of pink. And I wanted to add a little more depth and royal, bring out some kind of royal color, things that were royal looking to me. So I've added to this undulating pansy motif, I'm adding some purple. I don't know if I'm going to keep it if I'm going to make it balanced, excuse me, like the chart where there's a red in opposition to a red and a, a pink, a pink in opposition to a pink. I don't know if I'm going to do that or if I'm just going to make all four flowers different. I did, I did show this to some friends the other day and they said, oh no, just make them all different. So I am changing some of the flowers going around. Uh, I don't, I personally don't have to have things balanced always. I mean, that it doesn't bother me, but I do have to have some order to it. And so having these off balance here and maybe the colors balanced, I don't know, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> I did not correct some of the vine here, this interlocking vine that is done the little girl did accurately in two places and was kind of off in two places i did not correct that um i guess because they're opposing it's not bothering me i did change the alphabet here at the top i moved the eye over to the edge of this line if you look on the chart the eye is there's a big empty space towards the end of that. Now I could put initials in there. I could have put initials in there, but somehow that was kind of bothersome to me. So I wanted to, to adjust that. So I need to find places to put ancestry initials. I need to find a place to put my father's full name, a place to put uh, the motto of, from Peebles, Scotland, and the city Peebles, Scotland, so I don't really know, I haven't decided yet how I'm going to work that all in and what I'm going to remove or if I have to remove anything. I'd like to do kind of discreet, maybe over one in some spaces. And uh, Sarah, you know, has really inspired me with her adaptations and her finish. Um, so the way she handled it, she also did something and I, 
as soon as I saw it, I reached out to her and said, oh, would you be offended or would, it, would you be okay if I did my own idea, you know, my own version of what you've done on the roof? She actually gradated, she did a progressive color gradation on this really bubble pink roof. And so I'm thinking I will do the same, you know, with the colors that I have um, and go start with a really deep, almost, well, it's not really eggplant. It's a very deep maroon burgundy and then into a, a little bit lighter version of that and then progressing into this kind of raspberry pink and then the bubble gum pink. And, and then I think the, uh, the little man who is, it's supposed, or it's presumed that he is um, the Bonnie Prince, he just reminded me of my dad. Um, his attitude, his stance, his confidence, it just reminded me of my dad. And so that, there were several things that sucked me into this chart, but that was definitely one of them. So I think his clothing will be this color. My, my father loved to wear red. Uh, so it's going to be red, but I'm not sure what shade. And anyway, so I'm, I'm really having fun getting back into it. It's like an old friend. And sometimes you pick up an old project and you just still don't quite feel it. I just devoured it. So I'm hopefully, I mean, now I've got, you know, <laughs> I've got several things that I want to work on, but, and I, and scissor cases to make, but that one's, that one's going to be really fun. I did not get to uh, fruit tree with two animals. I kind of let that one slide this week. This one kind of took its place. I do want to commit to that, and I'm, I'm really committed to working on the over one so it doesn't get too crowded. I received a lovely comment from someone in Italy. Thank you so much. I have not had the... Uh, internet ability something's wrong when I try to respond to you and so I uh, I will I would like to share your comment next time so thank you so much and anytime anyone you if you make a comment and I don't respond it's either that I there's some block and I don't understand why or uh, you know somehow I was overlooked so please you know know that I your comments mean the world to me and I I take time to answer them as best I can so uh, okay and then I pulled out uh, Miss Hannah Lancaster and pardon me for bending over uh, and oh I should say on the old Scott I am stitching the old Scott on platinum using mostly a Verisois I think actually it's all a Verisois so and some of my own color changes and you know adaptations so and Hannah Lancaster is being stitched on Fuller's Teasel it's a 38 count linen and it is also being stitched with a bare soie soie d'alge the old Scott is soie d'alge a bare soie soie d'alge I'm sorry I think I'm excited so I'm not telling you all the details so this one, of course, you know, if you followed me, I, I had to start it because of the girl in her dress. And so here she is. Let me put these down. I did get a little bit more done on that rocky hill embankment on the sides. And I'm really excited to get up to the house. But I'm really, I'm trying to... Uh, plan my path so that I do some of the stitching of the words at the top and kind of work from bottom up and top down now kind of in tandem I'm very pleased with this progress I did uh, I did get some scroll bars I might load her on some scroll bars we'll see so very fun loving 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 this so it's nice when you have, you know, when you just love all your projects. I mean, I do. I love all my projects, and I wish I could stitch on all of them every day, but <clears throat> I've, I've unfortunately taken on too many. <laughs> okay, the next thing I did, I'm so excited about this start. This is so out of character for me. I have so many long-term projects. Sometimes, every once in a while, and you'll, if you follow me, you know I'm, it is very 
infrequently that I start a small, but I felt like I needed to start a small so I could feel a sense of completion. Now there was another thing tugging at me, and, and you're gonna explain that here in a minute. The reason I started this one in particular, now, so normally if I start a small, I, or you know a project that's going to be finished, I stitch it and then I go through my fabric and I find the perfect finishing fabric. This time was different and this is what led me to start this. I have had this fabric for a long time and it, is, it just sits on my shelf. I bought quite a bit of yardage of it. I just love it so much I can't even cut into it. I know that sounds crazy. I think those of you who have fabric collections and love fabric will understand. And maybe you feel that way even if it's linen or quilting fabric. I mean, there's sometimes you just want to save it because it's so special. So this is the fabric that I just, I just can't put into. So this has been calling out to me. And it is uh, a reproduction by Judy Rothermel. And let's see if it has any information on it. It's a Sturbridge Village. So it is a Sturbridge Village quilt reproduction fabric. And I think it is a documentary print. I am not sure about the color, I, but I can, I'll find that out. Anyway, there's something about this really fresh spring green and this little hint of yellow and that raspberry r pinky red. I don't know why, but I love this fabric. So somehow when I saw it, I knew I, I needed to use it for the finishing on something. And this little chart I had purchased at the attic last time I was there, and I thought this would work, but however, I couldn't use the called for colors. I was gonna to have to do my own adaptation and bring them into a really springtime mode. And I've always loved and admired the way Katie of Katie Strachan Embroidery personalizes her stitching in that way. She'll take motifs out. I mean, a lot of people do it, but you know, Katie, Katie is so well known for it and brings the colors into her palette. And, and she's inspired me to try this as well. So I, as you know, I love to play with color and I, I think it's going to be so much fun. Uh, I'm planning to do the same thing with this little piece and I want to finish it and show, have a nice showing of the fabric because to me that's, that was my springboard. So I should, here's the fabric. Here's the linen and a tiny start that might be uh, restarted, but this is Russian tea cake and I felt like that was a really good soft kind of mm, with a little hint of yellowy and some of the flosses that I've been playing with and I have got, I've got them in bags. So some of the greens, some of the yellows, I need to find some others that I think are going to work better. So stay tuned. That's that's coming next and a new adventure for me. I'm excited about that. I received some stitchy kindness and I received some stitchy kindness that was in the form of fabric that I will be sharing at a later date. So thank you, you know who you are and I can't tell any of you who have sent me anything. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful and please no obligate. I don't expect it, I, but I, I feel very loved when I receive it. So just so you know. I did receive this from Rebecca of Hedro Stitching. It's her new chart. Uh, Harriet Elizabeth Coney, and I think she said that uh, Olivia B is carrying this in her shop. You can also get a PDF download. So that, that was very kind. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So now I'd like to introduce you to a little bit more of the story about Corliss. If you've been following me, you know that I've been taking a fictional girl and creating a story that is based on journals and readings from a certain time period and centering it around this girl and her stitching journey. And so I'm trying to tie in a little bit of the material culture and what was going on around 
people and this girl in particular at the time that her stitching would have been done just to make it more interesting and fun. So here's Corliss and she is the fictional springboard for introducing stitching and sewing in 1870. This year we're focusing on 1870. Through the story of her life, we're going to get approximate experience of what it might have been like to live during this time and look at how things were done, especially stitching. So let's meet Corliss. Corliss is 12 years old and she lives in 1870. Her name is of British origin and it means carefree, cheerful, and benevolent. And I think it suits her very well. Corliss lives in Kentucky and she lives with her father and her stepmother. Corliss had the unfortunate experience of have, losing three brothers and her mother during the Civil War, which was from 1861 to 1865 and her, her three brothers were in service. Her father and Corliss and her father survived. Her father is a hemp broker and a farmer and he has remarried soon after his wife's death to a widow who lost her husband during the war and we're gonna learn more about them later. Corliss has a younger stepsister named Faraby and we're gonna talk more about her later as well. So educational opportunities have ended for Corliss in her town in, in Kentucky. And for a girl of her age, she's 12, and, and there are tensions in the home with the stepmother and stepsister situation. And her father, this has led her father to seek help from his uh, sister-in-law. So Corliss's mother's sister. So this would be his, his former sister-in-law. Um, Corliss's Aunt Edith and she lives in Louisville and often young girls of Corliss's age were sent to their relatives especially in these kind of situations for various reasons. Her aunt is an accomplished needlewoman. Aunt Edith is just very skilled and faithfully attends a weekly church sewing circle uh, and is a part of the ladies aid societies where articles of household textiles are made for charity work. And so Corliss is going to enter a world where she accompanies her aunt when making these social calls. And it's during these latter times that the ladies or the people involved in these events do their fancy work. And their fancy work is done using fancy work bags and baskets while visiting acquaintances in the neighborhood in the evenings and in the late afternoons. Now, Aunt Edith feels it's very important for Corliss to learn to be neat and tidy and to learn fine sewing, not just the patchwork, patching, and mending that she learned from Mama. So we're going to take an adventure with Corliss as she enters this new world at the tender age of 12. If you would like to read a blog that discusses a lot of these uh, notions and methods that are used in throughout the 18th, 19th century, pardon me, I really highly recommend that you look at the blog I've mentioned before called Two Threads Back. It's just beautifully produced, has gorgeous photos, it's delightful to read. Um, Melissa does a beautiful job presenting it and there are so many fun things to learn and I have uh, I have looked at that blog and gleaned so much from it and I hope you will too. I'll link that below. Very much worth watching. So we're going to learn more about Corliss's stitching adventures and Farabee's down the road as we as we move on in this uh, in this year. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the quilt behind me. Uh, I'll show you a picture of the full quilt right here. And I actually made two of these quilts because I have, in my guest room, I have twin beds. And these, these quilts were uh, inspired by a, a lovely quilter who is no longer with us named Di Ford. 
and she's produced some beautiful patterns and and uh, books by Quilt Mania. And her fur, her pat, the pattern I'm referring to is called Jane's Garden. It's in the Quilt Mania book called Primary Quilt Primarily Quilts Two. It's all about the fabric. So that will tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. Here's her version. She's got this beautiful applique center. I chose to leave that off for these. These are kind of more like utility quilts at the foot of the bed if guests, you know, get chilly and need some extra comfort. So I decided to save the applique for other projects. Uh, my version of this quilt uh, is it's a simple quilt so it has crossroad blocks which are not difficult and nine patch blocks which if you're following uh taryn repro quilt lover she is doing as a uh a challenge this year and so it's very simple piecing but what makes this quilt unique and different and fun and i think really interesting is the is the specific cutting of the fabric which is called fussy cutting and we're going to talk some more about fussy cutting when i when i introduce the hexagons to you in a minute but fussy cutting for those of you who may not know is where you take a fabric and you actually deliberately cut just certain motifs out of the fabric using a template or some kind of a, a device to to get that specific motif. And I'm going to put a couple pictures in here where you can see that I cut a specific flower out to use in the squares and I wanted it to be the same. It leaves your fabric looking kind of decimated at the end, but it has a really neat visual effect. So let me put a couple pictures in here of what a, a block looks like with fussy cutting for those of you who don't know. So you can see that there are some specific fabric uh, motifs that were used over and over again and I had so much fun doing this with this quilt. Now this quilt has some really strong yellows and some really strong pinks and also has red but because I used a tan and some brown for the accent pieces and the backdrop it really calmed it down in my opinion. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people have aversions to colors, but somehow when you add a touch of brown, it just mellows all of those and brings them down. So I had a lot of fun stitching this. I'm, I'm so glad I did it. Uh, I, I did, you know, ins I was completely inspired by Die Ford's quilt and I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't and didn't try to get the exact fabrics that she used. I wanted it to be my own and from my own stash. Uh, I love the palette. It's perfect for spring. Um, it's cheerful, it's happy, and um, I hope you enjoy it too. So as I mentioned in the opening, I am taking an interest list for the scissors, the dressmaker shears. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, I'll link below. Uh, you can look on my website. There is a, a visual video that shows you what these shears sound like and do, and they are a close approximation of what was available in the 19th century. Um, the people who've received them are, are delighted, and I'm so thrilled, and I've been so really just honored to be able to share them with you. I, am, I had so much more interest. I am doing another order, so if you are one of those people who would like a pair and would like to get on that interest list, please go over to my newsletter and sign up or and let me know uh, and I will be making announcements and keep keeping you uh, uh, informed and on the newsletter so really uh, you know I, I can't encourage you enough to do that um, 
I want to talk a little bit about the next thing that I'm going to unveil and this will come both of these items uh, well these this will come out this next item will come out next week I'm going to let people know on the newsletter first I'm waiting on one thing before I can launch this kit and as soon as it comes I'm going to let people know who've signed up for the newsletter and then you can go ahead and order this uh, hexagon kit that's what I'm talking about starter pack and uh, the tutorial will also then go up and this is going to be a free item for everyone that's interested and so I've had so many people want to know how to English paper piece so I thought you know this is something that Corliss likely would have been doing and other stitchers would have been doing during the 1870 time period. English paper piecing has dates back to the early uh, 1800s into the late 1700s. It came over from England, it started in England, and many coverlets and day um, summer spreads, which means there was no batting inside, uh, were made using this mosaic or honeycomb or uh, hexagon method. And there are several ways to approach it. And I'm going to show you my way. It's not necessarily the historic, it, it was done this way historically, but it's not the only way to do it. And I'll tell you why I like to, to uh, put my English paper piecing together this way. And so I'm offering a kit and in the kit, you'll get a binding clip, whoops. You'll get a needle. You'll get a, a picture of uh, my uh, start of my honeycomb hexagon English paper piece quilt. It has a little card on the back that tells you where to find the tutorial and what's involved, what's inside the kit. So inside the kit, and these are seven dollars, um, you get the papers and the pre-cut fabrics. So these are already cut into hexagon shapes to try your hand at making two hexagon flowers. So you have enough in here to make two hexagon flowers. You'll have uh, the seven papers required. You'll have a center and you'll have the petals. And the fun thing is, this is kind of a grab bag because each one of these glassine bags, they're pretty, I mean, there's very few repeats. They're all pretty different. And some of them, so I don't know what, I don't know which ones you'll get. Uh, I'll just grab this and, you know, mail it to you if you're interested. It'll be a lot of fun. You're, you're welcome to buy more than one um, kit. And uh, we're going to do go through this and learn how uh, how I like to English paper piece, and I'll explain why. Like I said, and just think of you know be mindful of Corliss and and know that this is something she likely would have been doing at her age. I know I mentioned last time that families would English paper piece in the evening by dim candlelight. I I find this a wonderful activity when your eyes are tired or. If, you've, um, if you're traveling, it's very portable. You don't need high magnification to work on it. Uh, your hands are busy. You're working with fiber and thread and needle, and it's very satisfying. The uh, kind of the, I want to say, meditative motion of basting is is kind of uh, it's soothing to the soul. And so there's no counting. There's no chart reading. It's just some very peaceful stitching. So I hope you'll join me. Even if you don't buy a kit, I hope you'll join me and you might want to try it out of fabrics you have in your own collection. Uh, if you're, if you are somebody who has fabrics and, and has collected them. Uh, I want to show you, now we talked about, I talked about this quilt behind me with fussy cutting. Well, one option, and we will talk more about it, is for, uh, for any kind of quilting is to fussy cut your fabric. And so I want, so I have fussy cut this motif out of the fabric and I've cut several that have this motif. 
And so, you know, that's, that's referred to as fussy cutting. But I want to show you what the fabric looks like when, you, when you're done. It looks like a piece of Swiss cheese. So it's just a lot of fun. And hexagons date back, you know, it was, it's, a hexagon is seen in nature. It has be, been tiled mosaics. It goes back into ancient times. Roman floors were done in, with hexagons. It's, it's seen in uh, all over. And uh, I find it really interesting that the early quilts were done or some early quilts were done using this method. And I, if you remember, I've mentioned it before, uh, the Lancastrian method where children wrapped the fabric over the paper to get a stitching line is very similar to the methods for English paper piecing. Um, hexagon, and I will link below uh, a museum in England where you can see some very early hexagon quilts. I think you will I think you'll enjoy looking at this. Now this is from Selvage magazine and that is the back side of a hexagon quilt and you like like we've talked about you can learn an awful lot from the back of a quilt. So uh, you know whether it was intentional or not the hexagon shape seems to pop up a lot everywhere and even the Quaker samplers have a lot of a hex have a lot of hexagon type motifs in them um, whether it was intentional or not I've listened to lectures and people assume maybe it was mathematical it it was uh, balanced it was peaceful and it, it uh, shared some of the attributes that Quakers found important so anyway, it's just interesting. So I'm excited to launch this with you. Sign up for the newsletter if you are interested. And uh, I will be launching the tutorial next week and making the kits available. Next time, I'm going to share more progress on my whips. I will talk about uh, the secrets in the stitches. I will bring back Lexi's quilt to take a look at. I'm going to share a little bit more with you about uh, Corliss and her stitching life and a little bit about Kentucky at that time and what was going on. So I uh, hope you'll join me and until then, make time for stitching.